So this was our data set last meeting. What we are trying to accomplish here is to determine whether three predictor variables, which are attitude towards academic dishonesty, subjective norms, or favorable subjective norms regarding academic dishonesty, behavioral control, can predict reported academic dishonesty behaviors or cheating. The theoretical framework that we are coming from is the theory of planned behavior. It suggests that behaviors are influenced directly by our intentions to behave in a certain manner. So in this case, engaging in academic dishonesty is predicted or should be predicted by our intentions to commit dishonesty. And the intention to commit dishonesty is influenced by three factors, which are attitude, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control. And from that theoretical framework, we are predicting that individuals who have a more positive attitude towards academic dishonesty, individuals whose subjective norms favor engaging in academic dishonesty, and individuals who perceive that they have a lot of behavioral control in enacting academic dishonesty are the individuals who are more likely to engage in academic dishonesty. So we made use of scales to measure these variables, and we collected data from about 524 participants. These are college students and these are their data. So each row that we can see here represents a single participant or a single case. So we have 524 participants or 524 cases. So each row are their respective measures of the four variables, attitude, subjective norms, behavioral control, and academic dishonesty. First, we ran a quick descriptive Particularly, we were interested only in the mean and standard deviation. So we removed the minimum and the maximum. These information, the mean and standard deviation, will be important when we report the basic descriptives of the four variables. So on the average, so these are their scores on the four respective variables. And likewise, we also included a measure of the variation of the average ratings for the four variables. And then what we did afterwards is that we ran bivariate correlations. So I'm, I'm going to click correlation. And as what I've told you in a correlation matrix, I normally enter the outcome variable first. So that would be academic dishonesty and then followed by the other variables. I would remove uh, report significance and then choose flag significant correlations for a more streamlined and parsimonious table. So in this table, we can see that all of our predictor variables are positively correlated with academic dishonesty. And to some extent, all of the predictor variables are also cor positively correlated with one another. However, this is not necessarily our test of hypothesis. This is just a preliminary test of association between our predictors and our outcome variable. In fact, in correlation, you will notice that we just enter all of the variables as variables without us having to specify which is the predictor and which is the outcome variable. These tests of associations are not ordered, meaning to say we are not specific as to which came first or which came next. Um, and that's why when you read publications, you will notice that correlation matrix are oftentimes labeled as zero-order correlation. Specifically, the kind of correlation analysis that we made use of is Pearson R correlation. Given that all of these variables are measured as scores from standardized instruments, or at least instruments that have been for which the psychometric properties have been checked. So we have a strong assumption that these scores come from an interval scale or interval scales. And that's why we are using Pearson R correlation specifically. So we've done our descriptive stats, we've done our preliminary correlations. It's now time to run our multiple regression. So to do that, let's click on regression and then let's choose linear regression. So this is our, these are our tables and this will be populated as soon as we select our dependent variable and independent variable. 
So what is our dependent variable? Our dependent variable is academic dishonesty. So we enter that. What are our covariates or predictor variables? So covariates also mean to say predictor variables. So we have three. So we enter that. And we have our results here. The method of regression. So if you click on this drop down list, you have enter, backward, forward, and stepwise regression. Since we're just doing a basic multiple linear regression, then we should select enter. As I have mentioned, backwards, forwards, and stepwise regressions are not very much used in our discipline because the sequence of entering the variables, if we use these particular types of methods of entry, are controlled by the computer and we do not want that. We don't want the computer or the software making decisions for us especially because we are the ones who are aware of the theory and how the variables should be entered and in what particular sequence. So we choose enter. If you're asking, sir, why is it that there is no option for hierarchical regression analysis, which you've mentioned in, a, in the lecture, that is because if you're going to do um, hierarchical regression analysis, you will also use this method, enter you'll notice that instead of only having one model in this table, we have two. We have this sort of null model and our sort of alternative model. Uh, you also have it here, there, and there. So basically what you want to do is to simply ignore this part, especially if you're just running simple um, multiple regression. So you ignore that part and you ignore that part. The part that we care about is this and this. Now, if you're asking, what is that for? This kind of table is sort of important if you're running hierarchical multiple regression. Let me go to the model. In hierarchical multiple regression, I told you that we use hierarchical multiple regression if we do not want to enter all of our predictor variables at the same time and we want to create some kind of hierarchy. For example, if your goal is to enter attitude first as the first variable and then see what's going on, see what the result is, and then afterwards you want to enter attitude and then together with subjective norms and behavioral control. So you have two levels of analysis. Now, the first one being attitude only and then the second one being attitude together with subjective norms and behavioral control. So that is hierarchical regression. Now to carry that out, if you click model, when you tick one of this, you're saying that this will be included in my step one of my hierarchical regression, for which the output actually is this and this. So this is sort of an output for hierarchical regression. Right now, what you can see here is zero multiple correlation coefficient, zero variance, zero adjusted variance, because there really is nothing on your null model, on your step one, essentially. But what if I add one of our three variables as our step one in hierarchical multiple regression? you will notice that these values will be populated instead of zero. So let's say, for example, if I'm running hierarchical multiple regression and I say let attitude be the first variable in step one of the hierarchical multiple regression, if I check on that, it's computing and you will notice that it's no longer zero. There is already an output for the first model. And in the coefficients, you will notice that previously what you only have here is the intercept, but now you have the intercept plus your first variable, which is the one we, which we check here, attitude. The bottom line is that the tables that you're seeing right now seem to be tables that are already ready for hierarchical regression. But since we're not doing hierarchical regression, you will notice that the first step is empty. So you will notice that your step one, there's no variable there. Only your y-intercept is available there. And that's why I said, if you're not running hierarchical multiple regression, you're running just a straightforward multiple regression, it's best that you ignore this part and you ignore this part. And that you focus your attention on each one. Okay, so I hope that that is clear. Um, in the options, you also have here, by default, naka-check yung include intercept. If you uncheck that, the values will change. So make sure that you do not uncheck this. 
always include the intercept because that is part of the regression equation, right? Okay, so this is our output. If we click on statistics, so let's check on collinearity diagnostics. The output will appear on this table. So if we click that, there you have your collinearity statistics. Now, what is collinearity statistics and why is it important to check? We know that when we run certain analysis, there are some assumptions that we have to check. And one important assumption in running multiple regression is that the predictors are not strongly correlated. And by strongly correlated, I'm not exactly sure what the textbook would say. But if any of your predictors are correlated anywhere between 0.7 and up with respect to collinearity, that would be something that you should be worried or at least cautious about. Right now, if we go to our correlations, there's really nothing to worry about because the correlations among the predictors, which are these coefficients, are really not that strong. So it's just ranging from 0.18 to point. So nothing really to be alarmed about. We should be alarmed or at least cautious when it's 0.7 and up. And what does it mean if, let's say, for example, attitude and subjective norms are correlated and well, the correlation is 0.8, that's a rather strong correlation, or 0.9? If variables are correlated that much, one particular reason for that is it might be that these two variables are measuring the same thing. And when two variables are measuring the same thing, you have two measures of the same construct. That is what you call as multicollinearity. And multicollinearity is a bad thing in the context of multiple regression analysis. So if we're going to run multiple regression analysis, we have to make sure that our variables are not collinear, that there is no multicollinearity in our predictor variables. Right now, we're safe, but I selected the collinearity statistics for demonstration purposes. If, let's say, for example, you have here, let's say, for example, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and you might suspect that, hmm, is that strong? Is there multicollinearity? Should I be worried? Because if there's multicollinearity, that will affect your analysis. So if that is the case, then you should really run your collinearity statistics. And what do you look for here? You look for uh, your VIF. And as a rule of thumb, your VIF should be less than 3. If it is greater than 3, that is an evidence for multicollinearity. Now, what do we do when we have multicollinearity? What are some of the remedies? First, if there is multicollinearity, then what you should do is to check your correlation coefficients and see which of the variables are having a very strong relationship. And if they are having a strong relationship, that may mean to say that these two variables are the same thing. So hypothetically, let's say, for example, that behavioral control and subjective norms have a correlation coefficient of 0.89, hypothetically. And then when you check the VIF, the VIF is actually greater than 3, uh, which means to say that we might have multicollinearity. So you cannot continue with your regression. Now, what do I do? One thing that you can do is, is it possible to merge or get a composite score of subjective norm and behavioral control? Essentially, the question is, can you, can you add these two subjective norms plus behavioral control and just get a single measure? If that is theoretically possible, then you can do that. If you think that subjective norms and behavioral control are really sort of a part of a single variable. So that's one option. If theory does not permit you to do that, theory is firm in the stand that these are two separate things which you really cannot merge or add. Another option is to eliminate one. And that would be your judgment call. So it's either you eliminate behavioral control or you eliminate subjective norm. That's option number two. 
option number three is more statistical and that is we analyze all of the items that were used to measure these three. We run what we call as factor analysis with the hope that when we run factor analysis, we would have evidence that instead of having three factors, we actually only have two factors. Which items goes with which would be informed by the factor analysis that we have run. So those are the three remedies when you encounter multicollinearity. And, and that's, that's the importance of being grounded in theory when you propose a hypothesis. Oftentimes, multicollinearity is encountered by researchers because in the first place, the researchers were not careful in conceptualizing the research problem. But right now, do we have a problem with multicollinearity? No, we don't. The correlations are not that strong enough. In fact, they're weak by Cohen's criteria. And our VIF are all less than three. So after checking for multicollinearity, I see that there's no problem. I will uncheck that. It's not necessary for my output. Next one is, um, let's check on confidence interval. So this is the confidence interval for your unstandardized regression coefficient. So this is important. All right. So th that's basically what you need. So this is our output. Let's talk about what we have here. So that we will not be confused, let me shade off the things that we don't really need to see. So imagine that if that's not present. Imagine that this is not present in multiple regression, there are two things that you are testing for. So this is our model. So we have three predictors. We have attitude, we have subjective norms, and we have perceived behavioral control, all of which we predict to be a factor in influencing academic dishonesty. Thus, we have this model. In multiple regression, there are two things that you are testing for. The first one is the collective impact of your predictors. Meaning to say, what is the impact of all of my predictors as a whole, as a collective, on my dependent variable? And when you talk about impact, more specifically, we're talking about variance explained. So what does variance explain mean again? When we talk about academic dishonesty, we have 524 participants here. And even if we consider ourselves, each one of us vary in our reported academic dishonesty. Some would report that they do not engage in academic dishonesty. Some would report that they engage in academic dishonesty. And there will be variation in a continuum from absolutely not engaging in any academic dishonesty to almost always you know, engaging in academic dishonesty. So there is variation. And why is there variation in academic dishonesty? There are many factors, right? It might be a sense of morality. We have different moral reasoning. What are other factors that can influence academic dishonesty? It might be the level of difficulty of the project might also be a factor. The more difficult the test is, the more likely it is that you will engage in academic dishonesty. Certainly for tests or quizzes or exams that are very easy, open notes, then academic dishonesty probably will not be much of a likelihood. That's another factor. It's also possible that recent events, for example, your brother just got expelled for academic dishonesty, that probably will make you hesitate more to engage in academic dishonesty. So a lot of possible factors. And when we account for all of those reasons, we are talking about 100% of the variance explained. But the question with regard to collective impact is that out of 100%, how much percentage of variance is accounted for by specifically these three as a collective? How much variance out of 100% is accounted for by a positive attitude towards academic dishonesty, subjective norms favoring dishonesty, and perceived behavioral control in engaging academic dishonesty? How much can they account for? And that is what you talk about when you say the collective impact. 
The second one that we are testing for is for the unique contribution. And basically, when you say unique contribution, that simply is what is the impact of attitude on academic dishonesty independently? What about social norms? What is the impact of social norms on academic dishonesty as an independent variable? And what about perceived control? So each of these three has a unique contribution. It's quite possible that only two of them are actual predictors and one of them is not a predictor. It's quite possible that all of them have their own unique contribution. It's even possible that only perceived behavioral control is a contributor, but not attitude and subjective norms. So each of these would have varying unique contribution to academic dishonesty. And that is the second thing that we are testing for. We are hypothesizing that collectively, these three should influence or should explain variation in academic dishonesty, and that these three, all of them, have unique contribution to academic dishonesty. So those are the things that we are hypothesizing. So the question now is, where do we find that in our result? Let's talk about the collective impact first. And it's easy to spot that the output that you should be concerned about is this one, the model summary. In the model summary, we have here um, R, R squared, and adjusted R squared, and our measures of error. So let's talk about these one by one. R is your multiple correlation coefficient. That value is this one, 0.537. Now, what does the multiple correlation coefficient mean? Basically, it is a measure of how all of attitude, subjective norms, and perceived behavior control are correlated with academic dishonesty. As opposed to Pearson R correlation, these correlation coefficients are the measure of their association between attitude and academic dishonesty. That's it. Subjective norms and academic dishonesty. There you go. Behavioral control and academic dishonesty. There you go. But as a whole, all of these three, or what is the measure of their association with academic dishonesty? Not individually, but as a whole. That measure is precisely this. 0.537. So that is a measure of the collective association of the three predictor variables with academic dishonesty. Multiple correlation coefficient. Next, R squared is a square of 0.537, which is our R. And what do we do when we square? We simply multiply the value with itself. So when you multiply 0.537 times 0.537, then what you will get is your R squared. And R squared is your variance. It's a measure of your variance. Or what we have mentioned here, which is variance explained. So that means to say that the only thing I have to do is to convert 0.288 into percentage. And if I do that, that would be 28.8%. And what is this 28.8%? This is the variance in academic dishonesty. That can be explained by the three predictor variables as a whole. However, when you report Normally, in reporting for variance explained, normally they don't use R squared. What they use actually is adjusted R squared. What is R squared and how is it different from adjusted R squared? R squared is variance that we are observing in the sample. However, because we're doing a hypothesis test, the variance in the population is relatively greater than the variation in the sample. And so, if this is what's happening in the actual data set, what we're actually interested more is, what is the possible measure in the population, given that we are hypothesizing for the population? And so, there is an adjustment made to our R-squared. And the adjustment is to take into account the possibility that the value might be slightly different as it actually happens in the population. So adjusted R squared is basically the estimated variance that is occurring in the population. 
So this is what's going on in your data. But if you are to consider what is happening in the population, this is your adjusted estimate. And that is why, because we are interested in inferring for the population, not only the current data set, that is why you will notice that in published materials, they don't report the variance based on the R squared. They report the variance based on the adjusted R squared. So if I'm going to write a paper about this, I'm not going to say 28.8. Instead, I'm going to report 28.4. So just a minor difference. This is my collective impact. So how do I phrase this? I could say it is estimated that 28.4% of the variation in academic dishonesty can be explained by one's attitude towards academic dishonesty, subjective norms, their perceived behavioral control. Now, another question is this value, 0.288, are we sure that this is significant? Are we sure that this different from zero? Because zero would mean to say zero percent, right? Meaning to say none of the variation in academic dishonesty is accounted for by attitude, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control. So we need to run a test of significance. And that test of significance is the reason why you have an ANOVA table here. If you try to look at your p-value, your p-value says less than 0.01. And that means to say, or that is an evidence, that 0.288 is really significantly different from zero. And that means to say that if I talk about the adjusted R-squared and the variance explained based on that adjusted R-squared, that is meaningful. That is significant. So if you have a measure of variance here, but this is not significant, then this measure of variance is just as good as zero, which means to say that collectively, the variables do not have an impact or cannot explain the outcome variable. But in our case, it can. If it's not significant, then there is no point in talking about unique contributions. But since collectively, we have evidence to suggest that these three really predict the outcome variable or accounts for significant variance in the outcome variable, then it is now meaningful to talk about the unique contribution of each of the predictor variables. And that's when we now proceed to our next table, the coefficients. So this table provides information exactly with regard to this the unique contribution of each variables. And you will see in this table, the three variables, attitude, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control. The first thing that we should do is do not be distracted by this row, the intercept. That is not really very meaningful. Remember the equation for a straight line, y apostrophe equals a plus uh, bx. In fact, since we have three predictor variables here, then this is B1x1 plus B2x2 plus B3x3. Each of these represent each of your three predictor variables. So this could be attitude, subjective norm, and perceived behavioral control. Uh, and the A here is the value of the outcome variable, the predicted value of academic dishonesty if all of these are 0, 0, 0. Because when x is 0, if attitude is 0, subjective norm is 0, perceived behavioral control is 0, then when you multiply any of that value with any coefficient, then all of these will be 0. So 0, 0, 0, 0. What do we have left? Your intercept. So when all of them are 0, what is the predicted value of academic dishonesty? your A, right there, 1.380. But like what I said, we're not interested in making regression equations because that's not exactly what we do in our discipline. So as a rule of thumb, just ignore this row about the intercept, okay? And let's focus our attention on the remaining output. The output for our three predictor variables right there. 
So what are these columns of values? Let me introduce them to you one by one. The first one is unstandardized regression coefficient. And the unstandardized regression coefficient are exactly your slopes in the equation. And when you talk about the unstandardized regression coefficient, in terms of notation, when you read journals, the notation for this is B. The next one is the standard error. We know that the coefficients are an approximation, an estimation, and around them, there is a possibility of error. So how much error do we expect? So these are the measure of the standard error. And these standard errors are also the basis for our confidence interval. So in creating the interval, let's say, for example, 0.252, having this error, that is actually around the confidence interval of 0.1152. 0.389. So this is the interval that surrounds this unstandardized coefficient, regression coefficient. Uh, and that goes for the rest. Now, we have a problem when it comes to unstandardized regression coefficients. These really do not demonstrate the relative contribution of attitude, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control. And if you want to sort of compare them, which of these three has the biggest impact or you know, relatively numerically, which of these three has the strongest impact? The unstandardized regression coefficients might not be able to provide us with that information. By unstandardized, it's almost like, or it is like I'm saying that whatever coefficients you're seeing here, that is based on raw scores, raw being unstandardized. And the problem with raw scores is that every measure might be different. For example, scale 1, the possible scores might be from 0 to 100. That is the possible raw score. Scale number 2, the possible scores only might be 0 to 10. That might be the possible scores. Or scale number 3 might be 5 to 55. Those are the possible raw scores. So we have here three different scales. And so when we talk about this unstandard distribution coefficient, this particular value uh, is the value that we use when we say, for example, for every one unit increase in attitude, there will be a 0.252 increase, kasi positive ito, in academic dishonesty. For every one unit increase in subjective norm, there will be a 0.285 increase in academic dishonesty. For every one unit increase in perceived behavioral control, there will be a 1.191 increase in academic dishonesty. And so if these three variables are measured by scales that have different ranges of scores, then it's really difficult to compare them. You cannot say that this is necessarily uh, the one with the biggest impact. What if the range of value is 0 to 10? So they are not comparable with one another because all of them are based on their raw score. So what do we do? What we want is for these values to be based as though they belong to the same scale and not three separate scales. And that's why in the next column, you have your standardized regression coefficients. So these values are basically these values, assuming that all of these variables are measured on the same kind of scale. Thus, this is your standardized regression coefficient. The notation, if this is what you call as B and standard error, you just call it as SE. Your standardized regression coefficient is what we refer to in notation as beta or beta weight. So when you encounter in publications the word beta weight, that is in reference to the standardized regression coefficient. And the notation is like this. And that is what you call as your beta. Next, in our collective impact, we wanted to know is this variance, is this R squared significantly different from zero? We also want to ask that in our standardized regression coefficient. 
is 0 0.138, 0 0.182, 0 0.403. Are they different from zero? Because if they're zero, then that means to say that these variables do not have any contribution to the, to the outcome variable. So that is the question. Are they different from zero? And every time that we ask, are they different from zero? Are they significantly different from zero? Then we will be needing some kind of test of significance. And that is the reason why you have a T value here. So the analysis runs a specialized kind of T statistic and it runs a T test. And these are your respective T values. Comparing your T values with the critical values, considering degrees of freedom, of course, we will derive a certain probability. That probability will tell us if these outputs are in the area of rejection or in the area of acceptance. And the probabilities, of course, will yield this, the respective T values. And what are we seeing right here? If our alpha level is 0 0.05, the probability for attitude is 0 0.001. That means to say that 0.138 is different from zero. What about subjective norms? Less than 0 0.05, less than 0 0.001 even. That means to say that 0 0.182 is different from zero. And what about perceived behavioral control? P-value of 0 0.001, same thing. So this means to say that 0 0.403 is different from zero. And that means to say that each and every one of these have a unique contribution to academic dishonesty. But take note, this does not always happen. It's possible that only one of them, only two of them are unique predictors. Another thing that I want to point out, because it's not showing here in our output, do not think that the unstandardized and the standardized regression coefficient are always positive like these. It is possible that these coefficients be negative. And that's why when you are reporting for the result of the contribution, you have to specify the direction. Is the contribution in a positive manner? Are they positively predicting academic dishonesty? In our case, yes, they are. But if it so happens that one of our coefficients are negative, then we should specify that this variable negatively predicts academic dishonesty. What else? Sometimes, so that you do not get blindsided, it's possible that in our correlation coefficients, our coefficients are all significant. But when it comes to regression, it's possible that only one of them or two of them significantly predict. So you might ask, how is that possible? How is it that based on correlation, they are significantly associated? But when you run regression, only two of them are significantly predicting the outcome variable. That is sort of to point out that to say that something is associated doesn't automatically mean to say that there is a predictive relationship between the two. Every time that you consider one of these output, for example, what do we see here? We see here that attitude positively predicts academic dishonesty. But there is one assumption that you should be aware about. That statement, attitude positively predicts academic dishonesty, given that it is a unique contribution, that statement is true, assuming that subjective norms and perceived behavioral control are held at a constant. Again, any impact that we talk about is under the assumption that subjective norms and perceived behavioral control are controlled for. If they're controlled, meaning to say they are the same for everyone, they are constant for everyone. It's not that they're really constant for, for everyone, it's just that this particular output is true under that assumption. And why is that important? Because, like what I said, not all things that are associated automatically have a predictive relationship. Let me give you an example, and I hope that my example makes things more clear. For example, if we have an outcome variable, and our outcome variable is the likelihood of having rabies, the one that you get if you are bitten by a rabid animal, 
And let's say, for example, that we have data suggesting that there are two possible predictors of the likelihood of having rabies. One is socioeconomic status. In particular, there is a pattern suggesting that those who are lower in the socioeconomic status are more likely to have rabies. And then the other one is exposure to animals. And the more we are exposed to animals, the more likely are we to have rabies. Now, we found out that yes, there is a correlation. And yes, there is a correlation between these two and between these two. But the question is, between socioeconomic status and exposure to animals, which between these two is the true predictor? Both are associated, but which between the two is a true predictor? Let me ask you a question. For example, we have two rooms. And in each room, we have several individuals. And these individuals have different level of socioeconomic status. Middle class, poor. So we have variation in what? We have variation in socioeconomic status. Now, what if I make exposure to a rabid animal a constant? What if I lock the door, no way to get out? And what if I released a rabid dog in the room? Because all of them are equally exposed to the rabid dog, that means to say that the rabid dog is a constant now, right? Because all of them are exposed. So this is now a constant. This has been controlled for constant. Now the question is, will the variation in socioeconomic status matter? When it comes to likelihood of having rabies, it no longer matters. All of them will have rabies. Tanggalin natin yung rabid animal. Constant pa rin naman. And the exposure is zero for all of them. Do you think their socioeconomic status would matter in their likelihood? Hindi rin. All of them would not have or unlikely to have rabies. So socioeconomic status is not really a, it's not a true predictor. Because when I test the impact of socioeconomic status, when I hold this as a constant, it cannot predict the likelihood of having rabies. Now let's do the same test for the other variable. Let's say, for example, I have two rooms. And in each room, there are four people. And let's make this time the socioeconomic status the one that is constant. Meaning to say, lahat ng mga ito ay either silang walo ay lahat ay mayayaman or silang walo ay lahat ay mahihirap or silang walo ay lahat ay middle class. Constant. Regardless whatever level that is. For as long as it's the same. And let's make our exposure to animal our variable. At ang ginawa ko, nagpakawala ako ng rabid dog sa room na ito. Not in this room. When socioeconomic status is constant, all of them are rich. Now, there is a variation in the exposure to animals, right? What is the variation? Exposed, not exposed. Do you think this variation will have an impact on the likelihood of having rabies? Certainly. And what is the prediction? Those who are more exposed are more likely to have rabies versus those who are not exposed. And so, when socioeconomic is held as a constant, the variation in whether you're exposed or not exposed can predict the likelihood of having rabies. So, although both of these variables are associated with the likelihood of having rabies, it is only the exposure to animal which is a true predictor of having rabies because SES does not predict it when you hold exposure to animal as a constant. But exposure to animal can predict the likelihood of having rabies when you hold SES at a constant. So between the two, this is a true predictor. Even if in the correlations, both of them are associated. So that is what I mean to say when I said that when you consider each of these rows, take note that you are interpreting them under the condition that the other variables are held at a constant. So that is how you run multiple regression analysis.